What's up, everybody? It's Young Cure with a Metal Gear Online trailer analysis. Today, I'll be analyzing the Metal Gear Online 3 world premiere trailer shown off during the Game Awards. There is a lot to talk about, so without further ado, let's dive right into it. I would like to begin by talking about a theory that I have about MGO3's character customization. This theory will be the foundation for many of the deductions that I'll be making throughout this analysis. From what I've observed, there is one feature new to MGO3 that changes everything, the class system, which was first hinted at in this excerpt from Metal Gear Online 3's press release, which reads as follows. With a focus on tactical team operations, the game features a class system that more uniquely defines the strengths and abilities of player characters on the battlefield. Unfortunately, the press release doesn't go beyond that, but it clearly states that the game aims to uniquely define player characters through the class system, which is why it is my belief that the class system will have a large influence on character customization. Before we dive further into this topic, allow me to relay some theories that I have about MGO3's class system. First of all, I believe that MGO3 will feature a total of three classes. There may be more, but the trailer only shows three. They're not very difficult to spot either. In fact, we don't even have to look at the trailer to find them. I believe that the characters in this MGO3 wallpaper represent the game's three classes. The reason I'm sure about this is because I noticed that every character build shown in this trailer follows one of these three distinct templates in terms of physical appearance and equipment. This is similar to many other games that employ a class system. In Destiny, for example, all three classes feature their own distinct style of clothing and equipment design that can't be found on any other class. As a result, it's very easy to distinguish one class from another. Another good example would be a game like Diablo 3. Every class in that game has their own unique aesthetic design and template, one that all of their equipment follow, making them easily distinguishable from one another. I believe MGO3 will be similar in that respect. To prove this point, I'll start by assigning classes to these three characters and providing a basic description of their aesthetic template. Since there aren't any official names for these classes, I'll be making up my own until they are officially announced. Let's begin with the character in the middle. I'll label his class as Soldier. The Soldier class is what you'd expect. They are heavily armored and heavily equipped for direct assault and combat situations. This class can easily be distinguished because it's the only one that wears fully enclosed helmets, bulky body armor, armor pieces on the arms and legs, shoulder sleeves, and this simple uniform design. Oh, by the way, uniform is what I'll be referring to any clothing worn underneath armor. Throughout this analysis, you will notice that the three classes have their own distinct uniform design, similar to how each class in Diablo 3 has their own basic uniform. Anyway, finally for the soldier class, it's the only one seen wielding heavy weapons like this machine gun. Next up is the character on the left. I'll label his class as Spy. This class is always lightly equipped, making them the best class for stealthy infiltration. Spies only wear light vests or armors over their uniform, and the spy's uniform design seems to have been inspired by MSF suits from what I can see. The tight leather rubber boots, leggings, and long sleeve gloves that are unique to spy uniforms make this class easily recognizable. Finally, we have the character on the right. I'll label his class as Support. The support class specializes in, well, supporting teammates, whether it be by providing cover fire, scouting, providing intel, and more. The support class always wears a headset, and their uniforms all have distinct features like baggy sleeves, a right knee pad, and pants with black legs below the knee with three horizontal indentations. Also, support is the only class seen wearing any kind of shoulder apparel, like scarves or, in this case, some kind of military-grade shoulder cover. It's also the only class seen wielding sniper rifles. So there you go, my theory of MGO3's three classes. I guarantee you that every build in this trailer will follow the aesthetic template of one of the three classes shown in the MGO3 wallpaper. To prove it, let's go ahead and analyze the footage. The trailer begins by showing the player cycling through various builds using the iDroid, confirming that character customization will make a return. No surprises there. 
It looks like MGO3 will also utilize the iDroid to ensure a seamless transition between gameplay and menus. We might be looking at actual gameplay footage showing a pre-game lobby of sorts, during which players can choose a custom character build to use before the match begins. Now let's rewind a bit and take a closer look at each character build. As I do so, I'll be naming them to keep track of them. This first build clearly falls in line with the Soldier Class template, featuring the same arm padding, shoulder sleeves, heavy body armor, and enclosed helmet as the soldier found in the wallpaper. They both even have the same machine attached to the back. The biggest difference between the two is that the soldier in this trailer is wearing a uniform customized with camo, which at a glance could easily be confused for Snake's Tiger Stripe camo. But this build's camo pattern features spots instead of stripes, so it's definitely different. Now, this build reminds me a lot of an XOF soldier, particularly the ones found in Phantom Pain. They both wear headset-equipped helmets, bulky body armors, arm padding, shoulder sleeves, some kind of machine on the back, and even small details like the placement of pouches and grenades are similar. They're not identical, however. XOF soldiers only wear arm protection on their left arm, while this build wears them on both. Also, while their equipment may look similar, if you look at the finer details, you will notice that they are definitely not identical. Finally, XOF soldiers don't wear camo uniforms. Let's call this build XOF Wannabe to keep track of them. This next build wears the same arm guards and camo as XOF Wannabe, but wears a different helmet and body armor. Even so, all the basic attributes of a soldier class template are still there. Enclosed helmet? Check. Heavy body armor? Check. Arm paddings and shoulder sleeves? Check. I'm gonna call this soldier build Mr. X, based on the X-like shape on the armor's back. Something I would like to point out about Mr. X is the grenades attached to the right side of his hip. It's hard to tell at a glance, but if you look closely, you can see that it says smoke, so they are definitely smoke grenades. The same grenades can also be found on XOF Wannabe. One more thing that caught my eye was this red canister on the back. I'm inclined to believe that it's simply a part of this armor's design and purely cosmetic, but it's hard to say for sure with MGO3, since unlike in past Metal Gear games, some equipped items or weapons will show on the character model, a feature allowed by the Fox Engine's graphical fidelity. This next build is yet another soldier class, and it's quite similar to XOF Wannabe, featuring the same body armor, arm paddings, pouches, and smoke grenades. But new to this build is the machine gun, which to me looks a lot like the M63 found in Peace Walker. Throughout this trailer, only soldier class builds can be seen wielding this type of weapon, perhaps suggesting that machine guns are exclusive to the soldier class. I'm gonna call this build Machine Gun Kid. Now, those who've played Ground Zeroes may recall that there are two types of primary weapons, hip weapons and back weapons. It looks like machine guns will be joining the back primary weapon family, which isn't surprising for a weapon of that size and weight. From the looks of it, this particular machine gun seems to be the same weapon that one of the African soldiers was wielding in the TGS 2014 African Jungle gameplay, both of which feature the same camo pattern on the ammo clip. A similar weapon can also be spotted in the MGO3 wallpaper, but the ammo clip here is colored plain white with a decal that reads 6A. This seems to suggest that certain weapons or weapon parts can be customized with paint jobs. Another notable change in Machine Gun Kid is the camo uniform, which based on my observations seems to be the DPM camo found in MGS3 and in Peace Walker, featuring the same mix of tan, brown, green, and black spots. As the camera pans, we are eventually shown a glimpse of Machine Gun Kid's helmet, which is different from XOF Wannabe's. This particular helmet seems to be the K63, which is a Russian military helmet found in MGO2. With the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan playing a pivotal role in Phantom Pain's story, the inclusion of Russian equipment is hardly surprising. This next Soldier Class build is basically Mr. X with different colors. I'll call him Mr. Yellow X because of the yellow interior on this armor. Notice how like Mr. X, Mr. Yellow X has a canister attached to its back. The canister only seems to appear on this specific type of armor, so I'm further inclined to believe that the canister is part of the armor's design and nothing more. 
As the camera pans, we see that Mr. Yellow X is wearing a gas mask, the same one worn by the soldier in the MGO3 wallpaper. From this angle, we can see that Mr. Yellow X comes equipped with a hip weapon, more specifically what I'm assuming to be the SVG-76, the fictional name given to what looks to me like either an AK-47 or an AK-74. Moving along, we are shown our very first spy class build. Uniform with long sleeve leather rubber gloves? Check. Light vest over the uniform? Check. Lightly equipped overall? Check. This particular build resembles an MSF recruit from Ground Zeroes, so I'm just gonna call him MSF Recruit. I say MSF and not Diamond Dogs because of the balaclava. MSF balaclavas have openings for each individual eye, while Diamond Dogs balaclavas have one long opening for both eyes. Another way to distinguish MSF balaclavas are these pieces attached on the sides. Something else to note about this particular shot is the eye droid. Like its single player counterpart, it features software version 3.02. Now what's weird is that the map shown in this eye droid is exactly the same as the one shown in the Afghanistan gameplay demo, despite the fact that the two locations are clearly different from one another. Keep in mind that this footage of Metal Gear Online is a work in progress, so this map is likely a placeholder. This next build is also a spy class, and this one is wearing the same light vest worn by the spy in the MGO3 wallpaper. This vest seems to draw inspiration from Snake's new sneaking suit from Phantom Pain, borrowing elements like the type of material and design choices like the collar. As for the uniform underneath, it's basically a different colored version of the uniforms worn by MSF Recruit and the spy in the MGO3 wallpaper, containing all the trademark features of a spy uniform, like the long sleeve gloves. New to this build is the Diamond Dogs Balaclava, which can be distinguished by this piece running over the nose and across the face. This one is a bit different though, featuring a piece of armor on the forehead that splits the Balaclava's single opening into two. Maybe this is a sign that MGO3 will allow players to customize equipment with extra pieces and attachments, or choose styles for certain equipment, like how players can choose between different versions of combat fatigues and phantom pain. Anyway, I'm gonna call this build Armored Diamond Dog, who we will see later again. The same uniform carries through to this next spy build, but this time with all black colors and a different vest. It's probably the lightest vest I've seen yet. As for the headgear, it seems to be an open face balaclava with a gas mask on top. To keep track of this build, I'll call him Psycho Mantis. Another point of interest about Psycho Mantis is his darker skin color, which means that either MGO2's racially diverse preset heads will make a return, or the game will feature an extensive RPG-style character customization that will allow players to choose a skin color. I would certainly prefer the latter. The player finally decides to use Snake for this match, who is currently wielding an MRS-4 rifle. It's not known if these characters are simply skins or if they have special abilities. So far, confirmed characters include Snake and Ocelot, but I'm also assuming that characters like Quiet and Skullface will make the cut as well. After the player chooses Snake, the camera pans to show seven other players, clearly indicating that this match is a 16-player 8 vs 8 game mode. Let's take a closer look at these seven other players, starting with this man on the right. Here is the trailer's first support class build. Uniform with black sleeves, right knee pad and pants with black legs below the knee with three horizontal indentations? Check. Headphones? Check. Scarf? Check. Now, unlike the support build in the MGO3 wallpaper, this one has camouflage on his uniform. It looks a lot like the Choco Chip camo, officially known as the Six Color Desert Pattern. Interesting to note is that there is camo on the scarf as well, indicating that scarves can be customized with different skins. Hopefully the same can be done with snake scarves in the single player. Now, if we compare this build scarf to snakes, you can see that they are worn a bit differently. Snake's scarf is slanted to the right, while this build scarf is worn symmetrically. It looks like scarves may come in many different styles in MGO3, and also likely in MGS5. Most eye-catching about this build are these goggles. I get the feeling that this is a support class exclusive headgear, similar to how enclosed helmets are exclusive to the soldier class. Now, I wonder if equipment like this will have any influence on gameplay, especially since MGO3 features a class system. While I have many theories on how the class system will affect character customization, I have no idea how it will affect gameplay. 
Will equipment influence stats like attack, defense, agility, or accuracy? Will certain equipment grant players unique skills, perks, or abilities? Or will the class system purely rely on a leveling system, with equipment being purely cosmetic, like an MGO2? It's hard to say, but if equipment somehow did have influence on gameplay, I would say that the goggles would either increase stats for an attribute like accuracy, or it would give players a special ability like thermal vision. Anyway, to keep track of this build, I'm gonna call him Virtual Boy. One last thing to note about Virtual Boy is that he comes equipped with a sniper rifle, the M2000 Sniper D to be exact. Throughout this trailer, no other class wields a sniper rifle, so they may be exclusive to the support class. Moving on, let's talk about the player crouching on the bottom right corner here. He's pretty much a carbon copy of MSF Recruit from before, except with a darker balaclava. This time we get a better look at the legs, and as you can see, they match the aesthetics of the Spy Class template. As for the guy above, he's pretty much a carbon copy of XOF Wannabe, wearing the same armors and weapons. We do get a closer look at the SVG-76 in this shot. From this angle, I'm thinking that the weapon resembles the AK-74 more than the 47, based on the color scheme. AK-47s more often seem to be associated with a darker shade of brown on the buttstock and the hand grip, as well as black ammo clips, like the one the African Child Soldier is wielding here in the E3 2013 trailer. AK-74s, on the other hand, seem to feature a lighter and more orangish shade of brown on the buttstock and the hand grip, along with ammo clips of the same color, very much like what's shown in this trailer. If we pan to the left, we will find another support class build, wearing the trademark support class uniform and headphones, but unlike Virtual Boy, he's not wearing a scarf, opting instead for some shoulder padding and pouches. His camo is also slightly different, with a pattern that's similar to Snake's Tiger Stripe camo, but with a color scheme that is more akin to the Choco Chip camo. An interesting blend of the two from the looks of it. Most interesting of all is the Solid Eye style eyepiece, which looks to me like some kind of one eye thermal goggle, but again, until we know more about the game's class system, it's hard to say if it will have any gameplay influence like stat increases or special ability. What I am sure of is that it is also an exclusive equipment for the support class like the goggles. I'm gonna call this build Solid Eye. One more thing to note about Solid Eye is that his primary weapon is an MRS-4 rifle. Panning further to the left, we will find what is essentially a front view of Mr. X. This one also has a canister attached to the back, further indicating that it's part of this armor's design. Nothing much else to say except that we do get a better look at the leg armor, which is some of the heaviest I've seen. This exact leg armor can also be found on the wallpaper soldier. Next, I would like to talk about the player crouching on the bottom left corner. He is pretty much a carbon copy of Armored Diamond Dog. This time we get a more complete look at the build, and again, it perfectly matches the spy template from the wallpaper. Attached to the back is what looks like some kind of radio device. Once again, I'm inclined to believe that it's part of the armor's design like the canister on all the Mr. X's. Last but not least, towards the leftmost side, you will find a build wearing the ghillie suit, which makes a return from MGO2. Out of all builds, this is the only one that's somewhat unconventional. At the end of the day though, I'm pretty sure he's a support class. The design of his uniform overall clearly resembles the ones worn by the other support class builds. As is expected from this type of build, its primary weapon is the M2000 Sniper D. I'm gonna call this guy Sniper Wolf for future reference. And that pretty much covers all the builds shown here. Enough about equipment, let's talk about gameplay. After everyone chooses their build, the camera cuts to Snake's perspective giving us a good glimpse of the defending team's base in the distance. And yes, I do believe that this match has an attacking team and a defending team, with each player playing under different conditions, but I'll get to that later. The camera then cuts in front of Snake, showing us what's behind the attacking team's starting point, which from the looks of it, seems to be a whole lot of nothing. Just a bunch of metal barrels and containers, along with a fence that encloses this map. MGO3 won't have any giant open world maps like the ones found in MGS5. It was confirmed by MGO3's creative director that matches will take place in custom self-contained versions of locations found in the single player mode. Moving on, we are shown the attacking team splitting up into four teams of two. Sniper Wolf and Mr. X split off first by heading towards their right. The next duo to split is XOF Wannabe and MSF Recruit, 
who climb up towards the right to meet up with Sniper Wolf and Mr. X, while Snake and Armored Diamond Dog continue moving forward. As for Virtual Boy and Solid Eye, the footage doesn't show where they split off to exactly, but based on their appearance later, they seem to have gone towards the left. Now, is it just me or does Armored Diamond Dog run slightly faster than Snake? It could just be an optical illusion, but maybe we are witnessing the class system at work here. Something else to note about this shot are the two turrets on the front wall of the defending team's base, strategically positioned to ensure that infiltration does not become as easy as waltzing through the main entrance. Weirdly enough though, not a single player in the defending team is making use of these powerful weapons. The camera then cuts to Sniper Wolf moving into place, which is followed by a voice that says, Spread out. Spread out. This was likely a preset codec message, which is a feature that has been confirmed to return for MGO3. We'll hear a bunch of these throughout this trailer. In the background, XOF Wannabe can be seen making his way past the east tower of the base. We will see a continuation of this later on. As for this guy on the right, that seems to be Solid Eye, although I don't know why he's here when he should be with Virtual Boy. They probably made this trailer by piecing together footage of multiple attempts at this match, so expect some inconsistencies here and there. While this is happening, Snake and Armored Diamond Dog continue making their way forward, directly towards the front door of the enemy base. Once in place, Snake uses what is essentially the enemy locator from MGO2, which allows its user to mark enemies and keep track of their location. In MGO2, the item was integrated with the game's SOP system, but in MGO3, the item will work in tandem with the new marking system. Like in MGO2, I'm assuming that the enemy locator only pulses for a short time before giving out, although its ability to mark targets permanently does seem to make it even more effective than before. As the enemy locator pulses, we can see defending players laying a number of traps around the base. This first player sets what is clearly C4. Less clear is the unknown trap placed by this second player. The trap is actually never used in this match, so it's hard to say what it does. The closest thing that I could find to it was the Fulton Mine from Peace Walker, but I don't think that's quite it. If you have any ideas, let us know in the comments below. Finally, the player closest to the camera sets a wolf plushie that seems to be modeled after DD, which we'll see in action later. The camera then cuts to Virtual Boy, who along with Solid Eye, moves into place towards the left side of the enemy base. As you can see, tagged targets can be seen by the entire team and not just by the individual who did the tagging, making this feature vital to success. Shortly after, a blue laser is pointed towards the enemy base. The laser is most likely emanating from Solid Eye's MRS-4 rifle. In Ground Zeroes, the only possible attachments for the MRS-4 rifle were a suppressor and a flashlight, but it seems as though that will be expanded upon in Phantom Pain. Now, interesting about this laser is that it's blue instead of the usual red. We saw something similar happen in the African Jungle gameplay with Quiet's green laser, and I deduced that this was likely done to allow players to differentiate between friendly lasers and enemy lasers. Quiet's laser was green because support buddies are represented by the color green when it comes to markers and map icons. In this trailer, I believe Solid Eye's laser is blue because that's the color that teammates are associated with in MGO3. The enemy team's lasers, on the other hand, will likely emit either the usual red color or this orange color they are associated with. Can you imagine if both enemies and allies had the same laser color? At the sight of a laser, it would be impossible to tell if a teammate is watching your back or if you're about to be fired upon. Color-coded lasers takes care of this problem. Virtual Boy then brings up his binoculars, spotting Snake and Armored Diamond Dog making their way further into enemy territory, the latter of whom is using some kind of stealth camouflage. This is proof that this match may be MGO3's version of team sneaking, since in a recent interview with 4Gamer, MGO3 creative director Kotaro Oki stated that team sneaking will make a return and confirmed that like in MGO2, players on the attacking team will be equipped with non-lethal weapons like trank guns, as well as special gear like stealth camouflage. Virtual Boy proceeds by marking an enemy target, providing his teammates valuable intel like the target's general location and movement. Something else that the creative director stated in the interview is that not all players have to necessarily be point men. Some of them can stay behind and focus purely on recon by tagging targets and providing valuable intel about enemy activity. 
His hope is that this will ensure that even less experienced players can significantly contribute to the team. Now, interesting to note is that Virtual Boy says enemy spotted right after marking the target. Everybody. Either he accessed his preset codec messages at an incredible speed, or the game may feature certain preset codec messages that will play automatically with certain actions or situations. I'm personally leaning more towards the latter. The camera then switches to Snake, and as he makes his approach to the target with his partner, you can just barely hear him say, take him out, likely another preset codec message. If you look closely, you will notice that the target matches the template of a support class. He's wearing headphones, he's got the pants with the black legs below the knee indented with three stripes, and he's wearing a shoulder cover with camouflage, similar to the one in the MGO3 wallpaper. I can't really make out the camo pattern because of the poor image quality, but it's definitely different from the ones we have seen thus far, indicating that MGO3 will feature a good variety of camo patterns. Armored Diamond Dog proceeds by disposing of the enemy patrol by using yet another CQC move from the single player. As Snake proceeds into enemy territory, we can see a side view of the two turrets guarding the base's main entrance. More subtle is what seems to be a turret version of the Fulton Launcher from Peace Walker, likely a trap placed by an enemy player. But unlike the Fulton Launcher, which Fultoned any soldiers within its projectile's blast radius, this turret only seems to be able to Fulton one soldier per round. Looks like the ability to Fulton soldiers in online matches will make a return from Peace Walker's Versus Ops. In Versus Ops, Fultoning an enemy soldier would count as a kill for the enemy team, and it would also give back a life to your team. MGO3 will likely employ something similar. Before moving on, I'd like to rewind for a second and point out this turret in the background. Unlike the ones we saw before, this one was definitely placed to be strategically advantageous for the attacking team. As we'll see later on, the attacking team's objective is to steal something from the enemy base, so this turret should come in handy when planning an escape route. Fortunately for Armored Diamond Dog, Snake shoots down the balloon before liftoff, Puyan style. To show his appreciation, Armored Diamond Dog uses the Thanks preset codec message. Thanks. Interesting to note is that the Fulton turret disappears after it's used. Either this is one of those trailer inconsistencies, or these Fulton turrets may be disposable one-time use only items. Eventually, the duo finally reaches enemy territory. Notice the tower in the background, the same one XOF wannabe headed towards in this previous shot. Inside the towers are searchlights that players can man, which should come in handy when playing this map during the nighttime. Now, MGO3 won't feature passage of time like MGS5, since developers found that matches didn't last long enough. But players can choose a time of day prior to starting a match. Snake proceeds by using his binoculars, and once again, we hear the enemy spotted preset Kodak message only moments after the enemy is spotted. Enemy spotted. Further corroborating my theory that certain Kodak messages may play automatically. Another player responds with acknowledged. Acknowledged. And then we get to witness the continuation of XOF Wannabe's infiltration. Looks like XOF Wannabe somehow made his way up the wall, most likely by climbing this container from last time we saw him. As XOF Wannabe moves in to take this enemy patrol down, since the patrol is not wearing any kind of mask, it's possible to see some head and facial features. I noticed that his hairstyle is different from Virtual Boy's, the only other build so far whose hair shows. Unfortunately, it's hard to say if MGO 3's character creator will be extensive enough to allow players to customize hair, or if it will bog down to choosing from a variety of ethnically diverse preset heads like in MGO 2. While MGO 2 did eventually add wigs in the scene expansion, they were considered head equipment, so wearing a wig meant missing out on other headgears like helmets and hats. Hopefully, MGO 3's character creator will be more extensive. As the enemy patrol gets knocked out, I notice that his marker changes from orange to this blue color for the briefest of seconds, and then back to orange with three S's on top. This is different from both Ground Zeroes and Phantom Pain. In Ground Zeroes, knocked out guards are represented by an orange marker with three dashes. In Phantom Pain, when guards are knocked out, their markers turn blue and remain blue, and the three dashes only appear when guards are incapacitated through coercion. Soldiers who have been knocked 
knocked out through physical means are now marked with the letters STN. So this is the first time I've seen the letters SSS on a marker. Either STN has been replaced with SSS in the latest build of Phantom Pain, or SSS has its own meaning. Perhaps SSS is used to indicate that players will regain consciousness much sooner than AIs. Incapacitated players will likely be able to shake the analog stick or something along those lines to speed up the recovery process like an MGO2. As for the color turning blue for a second, it's probably a small graphical error stemming from the fact that MGO3 uses the single player as a template in which the marker would normally turn blue. But in MGO3, enemy markers turn orange, perhaps as further reminder that incapacitated players will soon regain consciousness. Moving on, we get to witness Mr. X and MSF recruit waltzing into the enemy base through the main entrance, which doesn't end well for them. The former gets shot down, while the latter gets blown up by the C4 trap placed by one of the defending players. Speaking of traps, the mysterious trap from before is completely gone. It should be near the C4 on the other side of this immense structure, but as you can see, it's nowhere to be found. Either the trap was already used somehow, or it's another editing inconsistent. It's a shame that we don't get to see what it does. We then get a look at a few more customization options from the defending team's equipment. This spy class build, for example, is wearing the same equipment as Psycho Mantis, except his mask and vest are a light grey instead of green, and his skin color is light instead of dark. As for the soldier class build on the bottom left here, he seems to be yet another version of Mr. X, as noted by the canister on his back and the very familiar looking pieces of armor and accessories. His helmet is the same gas mask as the first Mr. X's that we saw, but the armor's color scheme is different, featuring mostly black with a slight hint of yellow on the inner part of the armor. His camo uniform is also different, featuring a color pattern that is similar to the camo worn by Snake at the end of the Gamescom 2014 Mother Base Infiltration demo. There is another player towards the left here, but he's being blocked, so it's hard to make out much, but he's definitely a soldier class build, as can be deduced by the leg armor only found on soldier classes. Snake proceeds by tagging what looks to me like some kind of terminal, which is what the attacking team has to infiltrate and what the defending team has to protect. This is further indication that this match is MGO3's version of team sneaking, with the terminal replacing the Karatan and the Gakko. After locating the target objective, Snake and company make their way down to enemy territory. We are then shown some pretty impressive team coordination, although the defending players here are clearly dumbing down their intelligence for demonstration purposes. The trank guns used by the attacking team is further proof that this match is likely team sneaking. And speaking of trank guns, it looks like they can be upgraded with custom parts like this laser attachment. After coordinating with preset codec messages, all three enemy targets are taken down at once. And again, notice how the markers remain orange instead of turning blue, likely to remind players that unconsciousness works differently online. We are then shown the effects of the wolf plushie, which is pretty much a more innocent version of the porn magazines from past games. Anyone who approaches it will automatically become distracted by its adorableness, rendering the victim useless for a while. From the looks of it, it seems as though the item can only affect one player at a time, as noted by how Snake approaches the trap with no problems after Armor Diamond Dog falls for it. And here comes the mountable mini metal gear, which we first got a glimpse of back in the extended E3 2013 trailer. The two are pretty much the same model with the exception of three things. The least notable difference is that the E3 2013 version has yellow decals all throughout its body, while the MGO3 version has white decals. The decals are also quite different in design. Looks like these mini metal gears can be customized with paint jobs, which is cool. A more notable difference is the weapons they wield. The E3 2013 version's weapon looks like a giant submachine gun, while the MGO3 version's weapon is a Gatling gun. This seems to suggest that players will be able to customize what weapons these mini Metal Gears wield, both in the single player and the multiplayer. Now, interesting to note is that the E3 2013 mini Metal Gear draws its weapon from the right side, while the one in the MGO3 trailer draws its weapon from the left, indicating that both shoulders are slots for weapon attachments. Perhaps it's possible for the mini Metal Gear to wield two weapons at a time. One last difference is the heads, 
The E3 2013 versions head is a robotic attachment that somewhat reminds me of the Metal Gear Mark II from MGS4, while the MGO3 versions head is a gun shield. Looks like another aspect to customization will be the head attachment, with different heads having different functionalities. The gun shield attachment is obviously used to protect its user from enemy fire, but what about this robot head? My theory, based on its appearance, is that it will serve as some kind of targeting system that will give users advantages when it comes to finding targets, aiming, and shooting. Now, one theory that I have about the mini Metal Gear is that in team sneaking, it will always start on the defending team's side. I believe that, similarly to how the attacking team is given exclusive advantages like stealth camo, the defending team is given exclusive advantages as well, with one such advantage being that they get dibs on using the mini Metal Gear first. Before moving on, I'd like to take a look at the defending player on the bottom left here. He is definitely a support class build, as noted by the headset, the shoulder cover, and the uniform with the right knee pad and the pants with black legs below the knees with the three horizontal indentations. In fact, this build is quite similar to Solid Eye, wearing a high-tech eyepiece on the right eye and everything, so I'll call him Solid Eye as well. Moving on, after making his oh shit face, Snake dives into cover as the defending player unleashes hell with a mini Metal Gear. Armored Diamond Dog isn't so lucky. Making matters worse for Snake, the remaining defending players start closing in. I'll talk about their equipment later when the footage shows a better view of them. After Snake turns around to plan his next move, XOF Wannabe can be spotted right next to the terminal, standing still as if waiting for something. Perhaps he's in the middle of downloading data from the terminal in a similar fashion to capturing control points in Call of Duty's Domination or Battlefield's Conquest. Maybe as long as he stays within a certain area centered around the terminal, the process of retrieving the data won't be interrupted. Another possibility is that he might be waiting for the right moment before finally snatching away the data and drawing attention to himself. While this is happening, notice all the sand blowing into the base, indicating that the arrival of a sandstorm is imminent. During his interview with 4Gamer, the creative director confirmed that MGO3 will feature dynamic weather like MGS5, meaning that depending on the map, players may experience sandstorms, rainstorms, and other weather conditions that will keep gameplay varied and dynamic throughout a match. To escape from the enemy, Snake proceeds by using a brand new item that looks like a metallic ring. As he pulls out the ring, a virtual light blue circle appears showing the item's area of effect. As he places the item down, dark smoke can be seen emanating from under Snake's feet, and light smoke can be seen emanating in the distance, as if the entrance and exit to a portal had been opened. The particle effects are quite similar to Quiet's invisibility powers, but they are not the same. The biggest difference is that Quiet's power causes her inner organs to briefly become exposed, while Snake's item makes its user seem as though they are burning to ashes. Also, their powers are actually quite different. Quiet's power turns her invisible, while Snake's item allows users to teleport. I still have to wonder if there is some kind of connection between Quiet's power and this item. Is Quiet's power some kind of technology, or is it actually a supernatural power? We will probably have to wait until the game comes out to find out. Now, I've heard of people say that this item may require two players, with the assumption being that Snake placed the portal's entrance while XOF Wannabe placed the exit. But from what I've seen, there is nothing on the ground where the light smoke appears, and XOF Wannabe never shows any signs that he placed an item, so I personally think that the item can be used solo. The way I think it works is that it allows players to teleport a short distance towards the direction they are facing. Something else that I noticed about the teleportation item is that the portals don't dissipate after they are used. Notice how when Snake appears on the other side, the two portals are still there. It seems as though these portals will remain open for some time, probably a few seconds after they are placed, allowing multiple users to take advantage of them from a single use of the item. For example, if Snake had been pinned down here with a couple of his teammates, my assumption is that all of them could have made their escape by taking turns with the portal. Anyway, after Snake reappears on the other side, the mech's pilot pops his head out, revealing a build wearing a military beret. I'm gonna call this build Colonel. 
We get a better look at his full costume when the camera cuts to Snake. He is definitely a spy class build based on the leather rubber boots, leggings, and long sleeve gloves on his blue uniform. But unlike other spies, this one doesn't seem to be wearing any kind of light vest, although he is wearing some kind of light armor that covers the lower half of his body. After having made clever use of the teleportation item, Snake manages to get the upper hand, allowing him to perform a unique CQC move to take control of the defending team's mini metal gear. As he is doing so, it's possible to spot glimpses of the mini metal gear's analog interface. For example, on each side, you will find a horizontal handlebar for users to grab to maintain balance and control. Each side also features an orange button, which I'm assuming will arm that side's weapon when pressed. On the top center here is what looks like a radar. It might just be cosmetic, but if it does have some kind of gameplay functionality, I'd imagine it would detect approaching targets. Some more analog inputs can be found towards the bottom here, extruding from the inner casing. It's hard to say what they do, but I don't think it matters, so let's move on. After Snake takes control of the mini Metal Gear, we are shown a much better look at some of the remaining defending players. This player here seems to be a near exact replica of Psycho Mantis from earlier, while the man on the bottom left here is wearing a similar outfit, but with darker colors. I'm gonna call this guy Shadow Mantis. As for this third player, he is the defending team Solid Eye from before. Weapons wise, Shadow Mantis seems to be wielding what looks to me like the S1000 shotgun, which returns from Ground Zeroes. I am less sure about what the other two are wielding. In my eyes, they look like SVG-76s modified with hollow buttstocks and black hand grips, perhaps indicating that MGO3 will feature an extensive weapons customization system similar to MGS4s, but there's also the possibility that they might be completely different rifle models altogether that are new to MGS5 and MGO3. Now, interesting to note about Solid Eye is that he's wielding two hip weapons at a time. The one he's wielding is what I'm assuming to be the modified SVG-76, while the one holstered on his hip is the MRS-4 rifle from earlier. Could this be a sign that the game's class system will allow players to wield more than one hip weapon or back weapon at a time? Perhaps certain classes will be able to wield more weapons than others, or maybe it's got more to do with perks or skills. It's hard to say at this point, but there is no doubt that Solid Eye is wielding two hip weapons here, and it's gotta mean something. Moving on, we are shown Snake shredding Psycho Mantis and Solid Eye with a mini Metal Gear's Gatling gun, while XOF Wannabe takes down Shadow Mantis with his SVG-76 rifle with laser attachment. XOF Wannabe then proceeds by taking the data from the terminal, as noted by how the circular marker shifts from the terminal to the player. Either the data finally downloaded to XOF Wannabe after waiting nearby the terminal, or he decided that now was a good time to snatch away the data. I'm leaning more towards the latter, since XOF Wannabe seems to bump into the terminal right before the data is transferred, as if he chose to pick it up at that moment. Stealing the data triggers an alarm, putting defending players on alert. Reacting to the alarm's call, a few players make an attempt to stop XOF Wannabe. One of them is actually the player that got knocked out by XOF Wannabe a while back. Looks like he woke up from his unconscious state, allowing him to intervene. In this shot, we get a much closer look at his face, allowing us to compare his face to Colonel's. They look quite similar, to be honest, which doesn't bode well for hopes of an extensive RPG-style character creator, but it's still too early to say for sure. One last thing I'd like to point out about this shot is this cardboard box here. As we'll see in the next shot, this is actually a player using the cardboard box item to hide. Unfortunately for these two defending players, Snake has the mini Metal Gear under his control, which he uses to rain hell upon them. Then, out of nowhere, three Soldier Class players make an appearance, two of them with Ballistic Shields, which make a return from MGO2 and other games in the franchise. Interesting to note are the insignias on the shields. They can be clearly seen on this official screenshot, and as you can see, it says Liquid Strike Force, and shows a symbol of a puddle of water that is sort of morphing into a snake, a literal liquid snake. This seems to indicate that the ability to create and join clans and create emblems for them will make a return. Also, this could be a nudge from Kojima, stating that Liquid Snake will make an appearance in Phantom Pain in some way, shape, or form, most likely in the form of the youth who curses his fate, Eli. 
Moving on, as Snake approaches the enemy soldiers, if we freeze at the right moment, we can get a clear view of the shooter's helmet. Some of you may be wondering why I'm not using the screenshot for a clearer image, and that's because the soldier in the screenshot is wearing different equipment from the one in the footage. The one in the screenshot is wearing Mr. X's equipment, while the one in the footage is wearing Machine Gun Kid's equipment. The only resemblance between the screenshot version and the footage version is that they are wielding the same machine gun. I'm sure they are the same models, since the two feature identical barrels. Anyway, back to the helmet. This one is a different model from any soldier class helmets we have seen thus far. It's not the gas mask helmet or the K63. It somewhat reminds me of the flight helmet from MGO2, but with a more militarized look. And yes, I know that technically this isn't fully enclosed, but you get the idea. It's a heavy helmet, the likes of which can only be seen worn on the soldier class throughout this trailer. This helmet is also the first in this trailer to have been customized with camo, a feature that makes a return from MGO2. As mentioned before, he's pretty similar to Machine Gun Kid, wearing almost the same gear, the same DPM camo, and even wielding a machine gun as his primary weapon. Now, this machine gun is definitely larger than the one we saw before, more akin to an M60 rather than an M63. This shot also shows some kind of large communication device attached to this other soldier's back. It's located around the same area as other attachments we've seen before, like the canister on Mr. X and the radio on Armored Diamond Dog. So once again, I'll assume it's purely cosmetic until more information on the class system is revealed. We are then shown that the mini Metal Gear can do more than shoot heavy artillery. It can also use its legs to kick down enemy soldiers in close quarters, which seems to be a great tool for counteracting heavy types of defense like this ballistic shield. After kicking the three soldiers down and sending them flying like bowling pins, the mini Metal Gear is easily destroyed by a rocket launcher missile. Fortunately for Snake, he dives out of the way right on time before he's blown away with it. Looks like players will be able to dive out of the Mini Metal Gear in a similar fashion to how they can dive out of moving vehicles. We are then shown a shot of Snake aiming down the iron sights of his gun, and unlike in past games, Snake is actually aiming down his working left eye instead of his obliterated right eye, which is good to see. It's a small detail, but it makes a world of difference. The camera then cuts to a downed XOF wannabe, who was taken down by none other than Ocelot. As the camera pans back, we are shown two things. One is the rocket launcher he used to blow up the mini Metal Gear, allowing us to get a good look at it. This rocket launcher cannot be found in Ground Zeroes, but it does make an appearance during GDC 2013's Fox Engine demo. The closest thing that I could find to it from past games is the FIM-43 Red Eye from Peace Walker, the one with the infrared homing system. The second thing we are shown is that if the player carrying the data back to base dies, it remains there until somebody picks it up, as noted by the fact that XOF Wannabe is still marked by the circular marker. My assumption is that if the attacking player picks it up, they can carry on from where the fallen teammate left off, but if the enemy picks it up, then it'll automatically be sent back to base. Moving on, as the sandstorm kicks into full gear, we can see Ocelot making a fancy entrance. Based on how good the gun maneuvering animation looks, I would say this was actually motion captured from a real gun spinner. Now, these guns are definitely not the single action army that Ocelot usually uses. Fans are speculating that they are a pair of Mateba 2006 M's, Italian semi-automatic revolvers, although it'll probably be called something else in the game to avoid licensing issues. Because they are semi-automatic, Ocelot will be able to use both revolvers at the same time with ease. It'll be interesting to see how Ocelot handles himself with these new revolvers and Phantom Pain. Now, is it just me or does this encounter between Big Boss and Ocelot seem to reference this cutscene from Snake Eater that plays right before the boss battle against Ocelot? Both scenes show a one-on-one -on -one encounter between Big Boss and Ocelot in the middle of a sandstorm. Both show Ocelot spinning and juggling two revolvers, and both scenes even have some similar camera angles. Perhaps this was meant to be a little easter egg or a fan service of sorts. The trailer ends with the Metal Gear Online 3 logo. For those who are wondering about the diagonal slash on the red E, it was done so that it could be read as both E and 3, it's just a fancier way to write Metal Gear Online 3. Below the logo is a subtitle that reads Tactical Team Operations, which is slightly different from MGS5's subtitle, Tactical Espionage Operations. 
the subtitle is pretty self-explanatory. Like with previous MGOs, MGO3 will be included free of charge with its single-player counterpart. The current plan is to release both simultaneously, but according to the creative director, this decision isn't final. The trailer truly concludes with a little extra footage showing Snake taking a selfie with a restrained ocelot. Pretty hilarious stuff. It was confirmed during the creative director's interview with 4Gamer that selfies will be a gameplay feature. And from the looks of it, one way to use selfies is to humiliate enemy players and memorialize moments like these. Right as Snake takes the picture, notice how his face shifts to a smile. Like in Wind Waker HD and Grand Theft Auto V, MGO3 selfie feature likely allows players to select from a variety of facial expressions. Fingers crossed for Kiefer's monkey face. After the picture is taken, we are shown another example of a selfie picture. In this one, both of Snake's arms are free, perhaps suggesting that players can prop the camera down somewhere before taking a picture. Another possibility is that the picture was taken by another player. If the game includes a selfie feature, I'm assuming it will also allow players to take regular pictures as well. And thus, the trailer ends, which concludes my analysis of the footage. I hope that at this point I have convinced you that there is some credibility to my class system theory. Using this theory as a basis, I would now like to talk about how I think character customization will work. When creating a new character, the first choice players will make is likely their character's class, each equipped with their own class-specific uniform and probably some class-specific starter equipment. The next choice is likely gender, although oddly enough, I haven't seen a single female build in this MGO3 trailer. Then players will likely choose and hopefully customize a face, and maybe even customize their character's voice like in MGO2. Once all that's done, they can likely start equipping their character, although with few options starting out. In MGO2, the equipment categories were head, upper body, lower body, chest, waist, hands, feet, and accessories. MGO3 seems to streamline a few of these categories. Upper body and lower body, for example, have likely been combined into one category, which I'll label uniform. Unlike MGO2, which allowed players to mix and match shirts and pants, MGO3 seems to have a specific uniform for each class with a cohesive design from head to toe. From what I've seen in this trailer, the only aspect of uniforms that can be customized seems to be the color scheme, but even that has to be cohesive throughout. Now, I did notice that certain parts of each class's uniform can't be changed to a different color. The soldier class's arm and leg armors, the spy class's leather gloves, shoes, and leggings, and the bottom half section of the support buddy's pants seem to be the same color in every build, namely black. MGO3 also seems to streamline the hands and feet categories, maybe even removed altogether. I noticed that throughout the entire trailer, gloves and shoes never change beyond what comes default with each build's class-specific uniform. Perhaps hands and feet also belong to the uniform category now. I hope I'm wrong about this, since this would decrease customization options, but I just haven't seen much variety when it comes to gloves and shoes. Fortunately, remaining categories like head, chest, and waist seem to remain intact, but each class seems to have their own set of equipment. In this trailer, only builds who match the soldier class template wear head equipment like the gas mask helmet, the K63, and this unknown helmet, chest equipment like the heavy armors found on XOF Wannabe and Mr. X, and waist equipment like these heavily equipped pouches. Only build to match the Spy class template wear head equipment like the MSF and Diamond Dogs Balaclavas, chest equipment like the light vests found on MSF Recruit, Armored Diamond Dogs, and Psycho Mantis, and waist equipment like these pouches. Finally, only build to match the Support class template wear head equipment like high-tech goggles, headpieces, and headsets, body equipment like shoulder covers, scarves, and ghillie suits, and waist equipment like these ones. As you can see, there is ample evidence to corroborate my theory that MGO3 features three classes, each with their own unique uniform and set of equipment. But do keep in mind that this entire theory is all based on a four-minute trailer, which likely isn't enough time to show all possible equipment combinations. There is always the chance that the developers purposely matched up certain types of equipments and uniforms to make these character builds look neat. If that's the case, my entire theory falls apart, and this entire analysis amounts to almost nothing. But I'm personally sure that there's meaning to the uniform and equipment patterns found throughout this trailer. To conclude this analysis, I would like to share my final verdict for MGO3's equipment categories. 
I believe that they are uniform, where players can customize their class-specific uniform's color scheme, head, chest, waist, and maybe accessories. Upper body, lower body, hands, and feet just seem non-existent, which is why I believe they've been combined into this one uniform category. Now, before you express your disappointment for how streamlined this seems, keep in mind that, again, this is all based on observations made from a 4-minute trailer of a game that is still in development, so it's highly unlikely that the trailer is showing off all the capabilities and possibilities that MGO3's character customization will offer, which could be far more extensive than what I'm suggesting. So for now, take everything that I said about the class system and the character customization with a grain of salt. At the same time, keep in mind what I said, since there is always the chance that the theories I've shared in this trailer analysis may have some merit to them. And thus concludes my Metal Gear Online 3 trailer analysis. Thank you for tuning in. I would like to hear your thoughts and feedback, so don't be afraid to shoot away in the comments below. And if you made it all the way to here, God bless you, because I know this was a really long analysis. Anyway, to be further updated on Metal Gear Solid 5, be sure to join the nation by subscribing to Young Gear. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you very much, and Young out.